I want to speak to you on the subject this morning of King David, lessons in defeat, lessons in defeat. A warfare manual could be written from the giants and the enemies of Israel that David defeated. There has never been a greater warrior in the history of Israel and probably not in the history of the world than King David. The parallels are seemingly endless as we talk about this warrior of God and his one-of-a-kind special forces team, the mighty men. What a name. But sadly, some of the most valuable takeaways from David's life are the lessons from David's failures. Now, he didn't have many. At least there are not many that are written for our review in the Word of God. But there are actually failures that are revealed in the Scripture where David underperformed. He made glaring leadership missteps. He failed miserably as a dad. He at times misjudged the character of his inner circle to his own detriment and also to the detriment of the people that trusted and followed him. But this morning, we're going to direct our attention to one of the two major failures of this godly monarch's life. The first is found in 2 Samuel 11 and 1. And I want you just to follow along with me as I read. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Let me give you the Denny Duran um, inspired version of this passage. Let me read it with a few additions. Ready? Here it is. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle and David always went out to battle, David instead decided to send his general Joab in his place. And he sent his servants with Joab and all of Israel because he wanted to be at home alone in the palace. And they, of course, won the battle. Here is lesson number one from this defeat spiritually of David. We must never stop fighting. We belong in the battle. We must never stop fighting. We belong in the battle. The moment you relax... I can promise you, you are immediate prey for the world, the flesh, and the devil. When everything is great in your life, when it seems that the kids have never been better, when the finances have never been more sufficient, when your health is wonderful, when you're feeling great emotionally and mentally about everything around you, Wake up on that morning and put on your armor and go to battle. We must never, ever stop fighting this spiritual battle. We belong in the battle. I know that many of you have memorized the spiritual armor that the Word of God says that we are to put on. It's just great in our children's ministry, how that our kids memorize the armor of God. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. 
What you need to understand about that armor is that you're not putting it on for the parade. Because you are going to need it every single day of your life. Do you remember the story of Gideon? How that Gideon, at the very beginning of his calling, which was to go out and defeat the armies of God, didn't have enough soldiers to begin with. And so God's plan was to speak to him and say, you've got too many soldiers. And that made no sense to him because they were already outnumbered immeasurably. And so he says, okay, God, whatever you say. And the Lord speaks to him and said, this is the first thing that I want you to do. I want you to tell everybody in your army, if they want to go home, they can. If they don't want to fight, they don't have to. And so I'm sure it was with great trepidation that he faced these soldiers knowing that probably most of them wanted to go home. If they had their druthers, they'd druther go home. And sure enough, it thinned the troops substantially. And then God says, still too many. <laughs> and he's going, what? Still too many. He said, I want you to do this now. I want you to go down to that spring of water. And I want you to tell the guys to get them a drink. And he said, those that just start drinking the water, I want you to cut them from the team. But I want you to keep those that drink and are still battle ready. You see, this is what you have to understand. The people that make the final cut in spiritual warfare are those that are always battle ready. It is important for every one of us to understand that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. There is always a battle for your faith, for your health, for your children, for your livelihood. We must fight the good fight, for there is no furlough in this army or in this war. That's why at the end of Paul's life, he said this. He said, I have not lived a good life, been productive, been what I expected, been what I hoped to be. No. He said, this defines my life. I have fought a good fight. I got up every morning understanding that there is a war to be fought, and I am in the midst of it. And I've got a great thing to share with you this morning, and that is the war that you are fighting has already been won. All we're doing is stepping to the battle line and declaring that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Let's continue to read. You know, before I move on from this point, David's fall in this chapter, and those of you that know the Word of God know that this is the story of Bathsheba. Um, David had the most famous victory in the history of the world. He also had the most famous affair in the history of the world. David and Bathsheba have been on the movies for a lot of years. And David's fall in 2 Samuel 11, it really is alarming. You know, his life goals have pretty much uh, been achieved. His political enemies have all been vanquished. He's securely established on the throne as king over all of Israel at this stage of his life. The Philistines, the Armenians, the Moabites, the Edomites, 
all of his geographical enemies have been subdued. The Ark of the Covenant has now entered Jerusalem, which is a major, major success of his reign. He has multiple beautiful wives. And he has a harem of concubines. His uh, success is without parallel, and yet at this season of his life, he's bored. And he's even bored with war. Now, this is an amazing thing, because if you don't think that you can come to a place just like David, then read the description of his life one more time. He was a warrior who had never lost a fight. He had as many beautiful women as he desired. And people cheered for him when he walked through the streets. There was not one thing that he couldn't go out and buy that he wanted or anybody else in his family wanted. This guy had it all, folks. And yet he came to a place of boredom. You know what the enemy wants to do for you? He wants to bring you to a place of boredom where you don't see the glory of your life. You know that one of the most important principles of warfare is it's gratitude. It's every day looking at your wife across the kitchen table. Well, no, we'll let her put on makeup at lunch. At breakfast, I'm kidding. I got so many dirty looks from the sisters. I don't know. I, I did, I've never seen you give me dirty looks like that. I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me, sisters. You look across the breakfast table and you say, baby, you are gorgeous. I'm married to the most beautiful woman in the world. You're grateful. You're grateful for your kids. No matter if they're going through trials, you're just grateful for them. Just the fact that you love them, just the fact that you know that God is going to have the final say in their lives. You're grateful for the fact that you got a roof over your head. You're grateful for the fact that you can go to the grocery store and buy food. You're grateful for the fact that you can climb into an automobile and actually have a tank full of gas. You're just grateful for everything in your life so that you never, ever become bored and vulnerable. When you become bored and vulnerable, I promise you, the enemy is going to do his best to attack you, to wreak havoc in your life. All right. Alexander the Great, he is said to have wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Folks, let me just say this to you. Life is not about what we're accomplishing. Life is about the fact that every breath we take is a gift from a God who loves us and that we are on our way to an eternity with him. Go ahead and give the Lord praise if you're grateful. Lord, we love you. This is your house. Hallelujah, this house has been built for your worship. Let's keep reading. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, which, by the way, was one of David's mighty men. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Bible expositors and scholars will tell you that the language specifically is very key in this passage. It says, number one, that the king summoned her. What you have to understand in this day and age, it was a crime punishable by death to not obey the summons of the sovereign, of the king. She had to go. The other thing that you need to see is this, is that it doesn't say they lay with each other. Bible scholars are quick to point out 
that the way that this phrase is worded means that David took her by force. This is a horrible crime, and it's a horrible sin. In the midst of a man's greatness, in the midst of a man's glory, in the midst of a man's relationship with God, which was number one as far as God was concerned on the earth, this happens. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Now here's lesson number two this morning. You ready? We must be ready because temptation is coming, and it's beautiful. What you need to understand is temptation is not temptation unless it's tempting. Let me say it again. Temptation is not temptation unless it's tempting. You know what we have all been famous for saying? You know, I can defeat everything except this one thing. Really? Yep, just one thing I've had trouble with. Just one thing that continually tempts me. That's the way it is with everybody on the planet. Welcome to the human race. It's called temptation. And it wouldn't be temptation unless it was tempting. You know, the Word of God says this in James 1, 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Have you ever said that or heard anybody say it? Well, the Lord knows that I just, you know, he sent me this temptation. No, no, my friend, you ever read the Bible? God never tempts anybody. This is what the word says. It said, God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then when desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, this situation with David is the perfect acting out of this scripture. David is walking on the roof and he has lust in his heart. I don't think that this was the first time that women were bathing on the roof when David was walking there. That's my suspicion. I think he knew exactly what time to walk on the roof. I think he was walking on that roof understanding that this was the time when the neighbors would take their baths. And he saw this lady, and what happened? Because that was his temptation. That was his appetite. He sees her, and then he says, I've got to have her. Now, this is what happens with temptation. If he had seen her and been tempted by her, no foul, no sin. The Bible says even Jesus was tempted in every way that we were tempted. That's hard for me to comprehend, but I can tell you if the Bible says it, it's the truth. There is no sin in temptation. Please hear me. And probably, even as a believer, you're still going to struggle with the same temptation to be angry in an inordinate way, to be bitter, come on, to be jealous. You're going to be tempted with stress because for you to continually give yourself to stress is a lack of faith. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. With lust, with greed, there's some of you that you're bound by your money. I'm sorry you are. You know, the reason that you need to tithe more than anybody else in the world is because it'll free you from the fear of not having anything. 
You see, God's got an answer for everything we're facing in his book. But all of us have that thing that tempts us. All of us have that thing that draws us. And it will probably tempt and draw us our whole life long. But when you are tempted, there's no foul. When you're tempted, there's no sin. Everybody gets tempted. But the Bible says, then it is conceived. You know what conceived is? That means, means I own it. You see, temptation is a thought that comes in one ear and it goes out the other. You conceive it when it goes in one ear and you go, oh, stay right there. When you hang on to the temptation, when you think about how you're going to go about putting yourself in a position to actually fulfill whatever it is you were tempted to do. It's when you don't cast down the thought, when you don't war against the thought, when, when you don't resist the thought, but when you receive it. And you receive it, listen to me, as normal, natural, and something that is a part of your life. When you graft that temptation into your own flesh and you begin to wait on an opportunity to fulfill it, at that point, ladies and gentlemen, you are on your way to destruction. So, the thought is not the sin. The conception is the sin. And the, the language here, of course, is about gestation and, and birth. And that's exactly what happened here. David sees Bathsheba. He calls her to the house. That's the conception. And then he lays with her. That's the sin that is finished. And then they have a child. And God says to him, because of this sin that you have committed and the way that you have gone about this, that child is not going to live and the child dies. It's the perfect example of what we're talking about. Here's what I want you to understand. If you don't know how to resist temptation, there is death at the end of the road to something. It will be death to your marriage. It will be death to a relationship. It will be death to your own self-image. It will be death to your career. It will be death to your dreams. I can promise you the wages of sin is death. But thank God that scripture doesn't end there. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We must be ready. Temptation is coming and it's... Beautiful. David had an appetite for war and beautiful women. Satan knew what bait to use to hook him. And when Satan got him to look that second time, he had him. Satan knows what you're tempted with. You know, I love ice cream. I'm going to tell you something. I love ice cream. I do not understand anyone who doesn't love ice cream. But I was with a young man this week in Minnesota after church, and he was a young evangelist that had driven two hours for me just to speak into his life. And so I, I took him with me to the pastor's house, and we sat down, and uh, you know, and this guy had an opportunity to have cherry or butter pecan ice cream. I was going to have both. And this dude said, I always go with the healthy choice. And he took a fruit sickle. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Butter pecan. Cherry. Ice cream. Fruit sickle. I just ate what he had eaten too. Eaten too. I just ate my part and his part. All I can tell you is that young man's waist is 30 inches. Now, that's remarkable, isn't it? Uh, Pastor Rhonda, what's happening back there? What? She's in labor. I was talking about conception, and it just totally, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. I, here's what we're going to do right now. We're going we're gonna to pray for this 
young lady, and she's in labor. That is, hopefully that is really good news right now. Amen, in Jesus' name. All right, Father, I pray. Man, how many midwives do we have in this place? Everybody's going. Okay, good, good. Praise God. Everyone's going. Thank the Lord. Okay, good, good. All right. What's that? Is anybody ever a baby in church? I don't know. I don't know if they... Uh, you mean, it's what? It's happening out there right now, you think? Don't, brother, don't be fooling me like that. <laughs> okay, go on, Sarah. I know you want to go. Sarah, I know you want to go. Go. You're, I can see you're in the starter blocks there. So go ahead and go. Amen. Anybody else need to go out there? No? Praise God. I can't even remember what I'm preaching about. <laughs> All right. Well, let, me, let me finish. I got good notes. Thank God. All right. Let's continue. 2 Samuel eleven six 6 through 13. So David sent word to Joab. How many, how many of you love the word of God? Don't you just love the purity of the word of God? You're going to get a lot of Bible today. Sin. David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. Now, what has happened is he's gotten Uriah's uh, wife pregnant. And so he's now covering up. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. So this is what happens. He calls Uriah home from the battlefield, sends him home to his wife, hoping that he will sleep with her and then his sin will be covered. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths and my Lord Joab And the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. In other words, the soldiers are still at the battle line is what he's saying. He said, shall I then go down to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. 2 Samuel 11 through 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. So what he does is this. He is, his conscience is so seared right now that he literally writes the execution note for this wonderful, lovely, loyal man and puts his royal seal on it and then hands it to Uriah to deliver his own execution note to Joab. This is a mighty man, y'all. This is the guy that's been with David in the caves, hiding from Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. This is the guy that has gone to war with him against giants. This is his boy. David said to the messenger, 
thus you'll say to Joab, because Joab knows what's up, all right? Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it and encourage him. Horrible. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You think? Here's the third lesson. Lesson three. Hiding our sin from men does not hide our sin from God. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you, and I don't want this to alarm you. But there are people, dozens of people all over this place that right now are hiding their sin. It's never been easier to hide sin than it is today. There are so many ways. And there are many of you that are hiding your sin. In fact, some of the least likely of you in this place, the most godly, those that have been godly for a long, long time, are hiding your sin. But what you need to understand is you cannot hide it from God. You can hide it for a while from everybody else, but you cannot hide it from God. And the only thing that matters is what God thinks about it. It's not about hiding it from everyone else. Man can't do anything to you. You can lose a reputation, but you can regain it. You can lose opportunities, but there will always be more. You can lose what you think was your past glory, but there's always a future glory to be inherited. But when you hide from God, that's where things get very, very difficult. The first time man sinned in the garden, his first instinct was to hide from God. And it's been happening ever since. You know, hide and seek's a really big deal with my toddler grandchildren. I love hide and seek with my toddler grandchildren because I don't have to look very hard. I walk into the playroom and they will hide behind something, peek over the place where they're hiding and say, hey, pop, find me, find me. <laughs> They'll have a leg sticking out of here. Find me, pop. And so then I go into, oh, man, I, I know there's some place around here, you know, <laughs> they, they've got to be here somewhere. I, I don't know where. Has anybody seen Doc? Where's Doc at? Where's, yeah. Anybody seen Lennox? Where's Lennox? I, that's the way it is when you play hide and seek from God. You can hide really well, but it's just a joke. To think you can hide from God. Let me tell you, we cannot hide from God. You know, uh, let's continue to read. 2 Samuel 12 and 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Okay, so what's happened now is God sends his prophet named Nathan. He came to him and said to him, Got to tell you a story, chief. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, and he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And David's 
anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who's done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you're the man. You're the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. In other words, anything else you wanted. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You struck down Uriah the Hittite. You're a mighty man. You're a boy with the sword and have taken his wife, his only one, to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you've despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your very eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives inside of this son for you did it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. That's the judgment of God under the law. Lesson four. God will deal openly with what we have failed to deal with privately. God said to David, because you did this, it's going to be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You took this man's only wife. So I am going to give your wives to someone else. And his own son, Absalom, would one day lie with his wives as a symbol of dishonor under a tent before the eyes of all of Israel. Everything that God said would happen happened to David as a judgment. This is the difference between David and us. When we come to the Lord and we have greatly sinned and transgressed against him, he doesn't put the penalty of our sin on us. When we confess our sin, he puts the penalty, all of it, no matter how egregious, on a sacrificial lamb that was slain 2,000 years ago. All of our sin, all of the judgment is now placed upon Jesus Christ, the crucified one. See, I don't want that stuff to happen to me. It won't if you repent. People have often said, well, you know, there's still a reaping for sin because the fact is David repented, but he still had to reap. David was under the old covenant. Let me tell you about the cross of Jesus. The cross of Jesus cancels our debt once and for all. I'm not going to pay for my stuff, and you're not going to pay for your stuff. Can somebody give the Lord praise? There are natural residual things that you have to walk through. But I can tell you, it's not this kind of penalty. This penalty is thrown upon the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's lesson number four. God will deal openly with what we fail to deal with privately. I've had so many friends who've come to me privately with their sin. And I have watched God's love restore their confidence and their conscience. I've watched them recover what the enemy wanted to steal from them. Just by coming privately and saying, I just want to get rid of this. I want to repent. Now, my friend, repentance isn't saying I'm sorry. Repentance is when you turn on your heel and you walk the opposite direction. It's when you hate what you once loved and you love what you once hated. It's when you agree with God on everything and you want what he wants for you more than what you want for you. And when you come to that place, this is the guarantee I have. That because you have dealt with it privately, God will bless you and he will never, ever expose you publicly. That's the will and the purpose of God. Some people have mixed the old covenant with the new. 
the penalties of the old with the redemption of the new, and you can't do it. You've got to be an Old Testament guy or a New Testament. You've got to be you pay for it guy or he paid for it guy. And I am a he paid for it guy. Hallelujah. Here's lesson number five and the last one. David teaches us how to repent. Please come, uh, Alex. David teaches us how to repent. Second Samuel 12, 13, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. But in Psalm 51, we have David's repentance prayer. Now, this is what I want you to understand about David and his humility. We wouldn't know about any of this stuff and the details unless David had told us. Nobody was there when he sent for Bathsheba but him. He was the king. Every detail of this, David told us everything about his life everything about his failures everything about his pain as a result of it and that's what made him great in the eyes of God David didn't care what the people in his generation thought and even though he didn't know that there would be thousands of years of folks that would read manuscripts and now the printed page describing his horrible errors, he honestly didn't care what we were going to think either. He was just all about the opinion of God. And that's why he was God's man. That's why God would not cut him loose or cast him aside even after these horrible sins. He knew David preferred him. And because David preferred him, he preferred David. Listen to this salvation prayer, this prayer of repentance. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He struggled with it his whole life. Let me just tell you. It was hard for those under the old covenant to get rid of the past. David had a hard time forgiving himself. He said, my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you might be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin. My mother did conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was something that was used by the priest in ceremonial cleansing and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow let me hear joy and gladness let the bones you have broken rejoice hide your face from my sins blot out all my iniquities create in me a clean heart oh God Renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing heart and spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice. Or I'd give it to you. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A contrite a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. You see what he's saying is this. He's saying what I did affected everything. It affected even the whole city. It affected the nation. It affected everybody. I get it. You're your judgment of me is just and right. He said, but I need this more than anything. I need you right now to change me and create a clean heart in me. Stand with me, please, all over this place. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, this is one of those Sundays where God visits his church to perform a specific task. It's for a specific purpose. God has come powerfully to his church today. And he has come to cleanse his people from their sins. He has come to find you where you're hiding and to tell you that it's time for you to stop hiding. This is your time of change. This is going to save you destruction and trouble. And so many losses in life that are ahead of you can all be taken care of right now at these altars. How many of you all over this place as your heads are bowed and you're shut out with God? You say, Pastor Denny, I've justified some things that I should have dealt with a long time ago. But you'll say, I want to finish it off today. I want to finish it off today. On the count of three, lift your hand. One, two, three. All over this place. Put your hand up all over this place. I got to finish it off today. I've justified some things and I've put off dealing with some things, but I want to I want to finish it off today. I want to finish it off today. I want everyone in this place that lifted your hand, I want you to come to the front of this place because we're going to pray and God is going to deliver you and God is going to set you free. And this is going to be old-fashioned revival repentance. This is about to be one of those Sundays that we will point back to and say that was the beginning of something special in the house because people got honest before God. You'll say, I've got some hidden things, some small things. The Bible says this, it's the small foxes that destroy the vine. And what it's talking about is this. It's talking about the things that you kind of excuse and sweep under the rugs are the things that end up doing the most damage to your life. And so I want you to come right now and stand right here. Come and stand right here. In Jesus' name, come, come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, God, yes, God. Just bow your heads all over this place. And here's what I will tell you in a meeting like this, because I've been in thousands probably at this point in my life. There are those that come forward for prayer. And then there are those that are still not ready to be public because they're so ashamed. And they want God to deal with them at their chairs, at their seats. I've got good news for you. God will deal with you at your chair or in the back foyer or in the parking lot. There are going to be people here at the front. I wanted them here so I could pray for them and see them. But wherever you are, God will deal with you 
I want to set you free. Right? It's not about the proximity to the platform. It is about your proximity to His grace. And He is close to you right now with His grace. Hallelujah. Everyone at the front here, lift your hands and pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you. Right out loud, say it. Lord Jesus, thank you. This has been about me. And I know it. And there are things I haven't dealt with. You know what they are. I don't have to say them to you. I've confessed them many times. But one more time, I confess right now my sin. And I ask you to give me powerful, authoritative victory over this once and for all and one moment at a time. So right now, I declare that I am victorious. And I am victorious through the cross of Jesus. I am victorious because of blood that was shed. David cried for hyssop to cleanse him. David cried for hyssop to cleanse him. Say that. But I don't cry for hyssop. I cry for blood. The blood that was shed 2,000 years ago that cleanses me through and through. I give you praise, Lord, because this is a new beginning. My friend, this is what I want to tell you. If you die in your sins, you'll be lost forever. I want this to ring in your ears. If you die in your sins, you will be lost forever. But if you have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Jesus will never cast you aside. He will never become impatient with you. He will work through your difficulties, your weaknesses of your flesh, and yes, your temptations. But you must confess your sins. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you glory that for this old-fashioned revival day. When we confess our sins and know that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. This is your day. Give the Lord praise. This is your day. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Come on. One more time. Let's give the Lord praise. Let's give him real praise. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Lord.